Jesus gospel today. Okay, I am, but I don't know about the rest of you. Anybody ready this morning? All right. It's going to be a wonderful passage of scripture today in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 through 34, where we find ourselves at today. Uh, this continues our Messianic King series. Today we are talking about the power of Jesus, the power of Jesus and how he holds the power over everything. Uh, if you're new with us, we've been walking through this gospel verse by verse, uh, walking through what Matthew has observed and the teachings that uh, Jesus has given in the life that he has lived. Matthew will take uh, a lot of physical things that he has seen and make the connection. There is a spiritual lesson to be learned as well. And so Matthew has written this gospel more specifically to his Jewish brothers and sisters uh, that he is uh, wanting to prove that Jesus truly is the Son of God. Jesus truly is the Messiah. And so he uses this gospel uh, to reach out to them. And he also, uh, this gospel has been speaking uh, so many powerful principles that Jesus uh, has been wanting us to discover and grow and walk in. And so at this point, uh, we are going to finish uh, the chapter 8 of Matthew today. This chapter has been relatively powerful, very strong teaching by Jesus. And, um, and so this is following really the Sermon on the Mount. This is a very famous sermon of Jesus from Matthew 5, 6, and 7 of those chapters. And Jesus is now showing us exactly what he means. How many know actions speak louder than words? And so now Jesus has preached this rather famous sermon, and now he's showing people exactly what he means by it. Uh, and so Jesus is going to shock his crowd over and over and over. He's going to shock his followers over and over and over because of who he reaches out to first after preaching this Sermon on the Mount. So the first person he had come to in chapter 8 is a leper. This leper would be considered somebody to uh, be an outsider, somebody that doesn't feel like they belong. Jesus is inviting them into his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, as he would call it. So Jesus has invited the leper into his kingdom. Then Jesus ministers to a centurion, a Roman centurion, somebody that would be considered an enemy of Israel. And they would necessarily probably just feel condemned as a Roman centurion. And we see that through the story uh, that he has welcomed a centurion and said he has greater faith than anybody he's encountered up to that point. And so tremendous statement made by Jesus. So Jesus is welcoming the outsider. Jesus is welcoming those who feel condemned uh, by God and feel like an enemy of God. And then Peter, uh, then he ministers to Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, and that represents somebody who considers himself to be unworthy. And why do we say that? Is because uh, during their time, they didn't count uh, women in their number. They only counted to the, the men. And so uh, this person would not necessarily be considered worthy of being counted in a crowd. And, uh, and so we see that this is somebody who Jesus invites into his kingdom, somebody who feels unworthy. Then we see Jesus begin to invite those who have been possessed uh, by demons and Jesus is delivering them. And so now Jesus is bringing into his kingdom those who were once living in 100% complete darkness. And so this is why I continue to say there's no one that is too far from God, because this is literally covering everybody, I feel like. This is covering everybody that thinks that, that they don't belong, they don't, they're too far from God, or they feel like God can't change them, God can't do this, God can't do that, and Jesus is showing us right up front, He's inviting everybody into His kingdom. Those who are willing to follow Him, He's inviting them into it. And so last week, we saw what it takes to follow Jesus. And this is where it, things will get even more more shocking for them is because they have a culture, a mindset that is the same as it is today, as it was back then, that is based off of performance, right? Our world is based off of performance, right? And so this is the mindset that culture has. And so Jesus is going to tell us that following him doesn't necessarily mean you're going to rise and influenced by the world's standards. You're not necessarily going to gain more power by the world's standards. In fact, Jesus must transform your mind from a, uh, from a performance-based mindset to what? To a transformed-based mindset. He wants to transform your very mind because of the way the culture is. We have this thought often. And then the other thing is Jesus is going to teach us is that he is the priority over everything. And what example does he use or what, what story is brought up is Jesus 
uh, is talking to a man who wants to follow Jesus, but his family obligations are the top priority, not following Jesus. And Jesus says, you need to reverse that if you're going to follow me, which would be shocking, right? It would be very shocking that Jesus is saying, following me is above everything else. I am the top priority. Every obligation must come underneath me, not above me. And now we talked about this last week, and I'll give a quick summary, is that doesn't necessarily mean a time length where you're going 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there, 40 minutes here, all that. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is just telling us through the phrase, follow me, that in order for you to follow him, you need to be and grow in this concept of understanding that you need to be fully aware of him all the time. That is what Jesus means by it. That you have to have you begin to think of every thought, word, and action you use. Be fully aware of Jesus at all times. It is truly fascinating, and this would obviously shock his listeners. And so now today, Jesus is going to tell us how, or begin to show us his power and displaying it in a physical sense, but also in a spiritual sense. Now, when it comes to that word display, I think of the business world. How many know the business world? If you want to make a sale in your product, you need to display it good, right? You need to have a good display of what you're wanting to sell people. So you want people to experience that. You want people to maybe even feel the product. And then you begin to, to strategically communicate with them why it's so important that they need this in their life. Because why? Because you want to make a sale. So you have to display your product well especially in the food industry. And I tell you what, they make it look wonderful what the food looks like on TV. But then when I get it, I'm like, why does this look 100% different than what I just saw on TV? And they don't tell you the calories and carb count, amen? I mean, they don't tell you none of that stuff. They just want you to try their product, right? They, they want to make a sale. They want to earn business from you. And so how many of you have ever bought something before that you just immediately regretted after buying it? How many of you have tasted something before and you immediately regretted that you just put that thing in your mouth, whatever it was, amen? And so I remember one time several years ago that I was in the Middle East and I was with a group of people and we were in this one particular country that was relatively poor and, and we were in this actually really nice hotel that we were in and the staff of this hotel wanted to throw a dinner for us. And we're like, wow, that's really cool. And it was actually really amazing and good food. And, and so they had their whole, uh, a bunch of their hotel staff there, about a dozen of them standing there. And they must have known the American way because it was buffet style, amen? And so uh, they uh, started serving us the food as we would walk up. They would put things on our plate, all that good stuff. But before we started to eat, our, our leader told us, say, hey, whatever is put on your plate, you better eat it because it could be considered something that it could be like a slap in the face to them. It could be uh, they could take offense that you're not eating the food that you put on your plate. So you need whatever you want. Make sure you'll eat it. And of course, everybody's like, oh, yeah, 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 sure. We'll eat everything. And so I tried a lot of new food that was really, really good stuff. And then I went to this one particular spot where it looked like this nice, delicious dessert that looked like this rainbow kind of cake. And I was like, wow, this looks fascinating. I really want to try it. It looks fruity. It looks delicious. I just want to eat it, right? And so I get one on my plate and I sit down and I, I take my first bite. And it was that moment where I immediately regretted what I just put in my mouth. And still to this day, I cannot describe to you what it tasted like. All I know is all the, the lesson I just learned from my group leader, that whatever you put on your plate, you better eat it and you better swallow it. I just threw that 100% out the door, okay? I did not swallow that food, whatever it was. I don't know what it was, okay? And I can tell you, you can, you can connect the dots, that if I didn't swallow it, what did I do, okay? Think about it for a second. It immediately came out, okay? Onto my plate and, and I'm like, oh no. Like I just... I just did the unforgivable sin I felt like in this, in this hotel, right? And then, I, then I, I had my head down. I'm like, okay, maybe none of the hotel staff are looking at me. Maybe they're just busy doing their job, right? That would be a, a very common thing to think. I was like, okay, they're, they're doing their job, right? And then I look up and to my terror, I see it was like all of them, all of them, we're staring right at me, right? And they're looking at me and I'm just like, I had nothing I could say. So I did the only thing I knew to do in that moment and that was put my head down, okay? And shame and embarrassment and asking for forgiveness in some way, shape or form, which I don't know if they did or not, but I probably deeply offended them. So um, 
Needless to say, I did not finish that food. I could not, I could not convince myself to do that. And so um, that's okay. Today we're going to talk about something that is going to be relatively awesome. So God's going to display his power and you're going to love it. I promise you. Okay. You won't regret it. You won't regret being here today. Praise the Lord. And so we're going to be in chapter 8, verse 23 through 27 in this first point. Jesus is going to display his power in two different ways today. Number one, over nature. Number two, he's going to display it over spiritual forces. And so let's read this in verse 23. It says, Then he got up into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came upon the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, if you've been with us, and we've been talking about this often, and, uh, but what we've been noticing is Matthew is making a distinction between the crowd and followers, crowd and disciples. He continues to do that. So Jesus has revealed a number of different things that have been relatively shocking to his culture. Uh, and so Jesus has been making a lot of statements and it was just blowing their mind. And then he's, he's inviting people into his kingdom that they never thought he would invite into the kingdom of God. So up to this point, Matthew is continually telling us there's a difference between the crowd and the followers, and we see who gets in the boat with him, right? We see the disciples get in the boat. Those that are still choosing to follow Jesus, they get in the boat with him, and they go where he is going. And so as we look at this, and if you know about this particular area historically, this could, you know, because of the location, there would often be some of these storms that would come that would be uh, very dangerous. And these are one of these moments where this storm literally comes out of nowhere. This storm comes out of nowhere and it begins to uh, cause panic amongst the disciples and followers of Jesus. And what is Jesus doing in the middle of this storm? right? He's not on a yacht, okay? He is in a probably a fisherman's boat. And what is he doing? He's taking a nap, right? He's, t- he's sleeping through all this. Anybody got a, anybody a deep sleeper here? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, we got a few hands going up. You a deep sleeper? Amen. Jesus is deeply sleeping through this storm, right? And it's almost like Jesus is ignoring their problem. Have you ever asked God, why are you ignoring my problems, right? Have you ever felt that way? with him. Okay, you can be honest with God, trust me. Okay, you can say, God, are you just ignoring me? Like, do you not care? Have you ever made a statement like that before? I have. Like, God, do you not care about what I'm going through right now? Jesus is sleeping in the middle of a storm, and it's almost like Jesus has led them to the storm. Have you ever felt that way? Like, Jesus, you have led led me to the storm. Why did you do that? Right? And Jesus is sleeping in the boat, and the disciples come to him, and they wake him up. They say, help us. We're going to drown. It sounds pretty obvious, right? And then Jesus gives a surprising answer. He says, oh, you have little faith. You know, and it's like, okay, like, what is, what is Jesus saying? Why are you so afraid? And he rebukes the winds and the waves. It comes calm. And what's amazing about that, first of all, have you ever been on a boat and the waves have been very choppy because of the wind, right? Have you ever been on like that? What's amazing is, is Matthew is telling us when Jesus calms it, both stop at the same time. Think about that. Be in the boat and imagine yourself in the boat and Jesus rebukes the winds and the waves and it immediately stops. There's no choppiness in the water. There's no wind anymore. It immediately becomes calm. How many know when the wind dies down, naturally, the waves are still there, correct? So Matthew is telling us something amazing is happening, is that both stop at the same time. And it's showing us that as the world or nature has risen up against Jesus, Jesus puts it back in its place. Which kind of starts to tell you something about Jesus and about God, is that this, this idea of the world and of evil and all these things, that it, it, it is within God's control. And that he will calm it if it gets out of line. It's such a, an amazing principle that we're hearing, but what I want us to really focus on with Matthew here, and what Matthew is trying to tell us, is that, he's, that the response by Jesus starts to hint at something that sometimes uh, we're not taught this, okay? 
when you think about this, you may be thinking, well, he said, you have a little faith, why are you so afraid? A lot of times it's taught that, man, their faith in Jesus is not very strong, and Jesus is telling them it needs to get better. And it's like, Jesus, maybe he got up on the wrong side of the bed and was a little cranky. Anybody need their coffee first thing in the morning? Amen? Okay, maybe just me. But um, <laughs> Jesus is telling us something. He's not talking about necessarily about their faith in him, because you know why? Because it's in the passage. They came to Jesus for help, right? Which is like, that makes sense. If you have an issue and a problem, what, are, is it, what is a believer, what is a disciple of Jesus supposed to do? Go to Jesus, right? So what is Matthew trying to show us with Jesus' words? He's telling us something with the phrase, you have little faith. He's telling them, you lack faith confidence in who you are and who I've called you to be. That's what he's saying. You lack the confidence of who you are and who he's been, who they've been called to be. That's why he says you have little faith. Now, you may be thinking, well, Jesus says, if I have faith as small as a mustard seed, can I move a mountain, all that stuff? That's not what is being described here. Jesus is literally saying you have no confidence, none. So what is Jesus wanting to do? He's wanting to give us confidence and who he is, and what he has called us to be. But Jesus and Matthew is really teaching us something here. He's telling us the reason why Jesus must die on the cross. He's telling us that. He's giving us more and more reasons why Jesus must die on the cross. Jesus knows he has the authority to do whatever he wants. Jesus knows he has the authority. But what he under is, is showing us here is that the authority is not yet in them. So therefore, he must die on the cross. Do you get it? Do you see why he's saying it now? He's saying the authority is in me. Now I, now I got to get the authority in them. And why they are lacking so much faith is because they don't have confidence in who they are and who they've been called to be. They are afraid. And fear is paralyzing when you come to following God. Fear, if you want to walk in God's calling, fear will cripple you and stop you from moving forward. That's what fear does. It cripples you from, from stepping into the calling God has placed on your life, both generally and specifically. It will cripple you if it gets a hold of you and controls you. And Jesus is wanting to give you and me, watch this, confidence in his power and authority in your life. Isn't that amazing? This is why often you read it and go, I don't deserve that. Are you kidding me? I don't deserve his power and authority. And Jesus is showing us something. He's giving it to us because it's a gift. It's a grace, something you and I don't deserve. And he's going to give it to you. And that's why he must go to the cross because it's obviously not in them. And this moment is actually a moment to test their faith and confidence in who they are and who they've been called to be. It's not that they don't believe in who Jesus is. They believe in who he is. They're saying, man, Jesus, like you save us, please. And then they're blown away by the fact of what he's able to do. And he blows them away. He's like, man, they, not only is Jesus amazing where he can control the winds and the waves, this is fascinating, but they're starting to get these hints that Jesus is wanting to give them the same authority that he has. It's truly amazing. This is why I always say God is the most generous of all. He even wants to give you the same power and authority in him, which is why he must go to the cross, which is why he must resurrect from the dead and to give you that same power. It's absolutely fascinating. And so when things in this life come and you're unprepared for it, Jesus doesn't want you to be afraid. Jesus wants you to operate in authority. Yes, you can come to him, but you also, God is calling you to walk in power with Jesus. This is simply Amazing. Now, I don't necessarily try to do this, but I think it'll help. Now it makes more sense when you get to the last chapter of Matthew, Matthew 28. And what does he say? All authority in heaven on earth, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then what does he tell them? Then what does he tell the disciples right before he leaves? Now you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now do you see the authority? He's saying the authority is now in you. Now go. 
So when you follow Jesus, when you give your life to Christ, he is now putting authority in you. Isn't that amazing? Simply fascinating what Jesus is doing here. And Matthew is showing us why he must die on the cross. Because obviously the authority is not yet in them. And there will be glimpses in Jesus' ministry where they will experience that. But Jesus wants them to experience that all the time, every day. This is simply absolutely amazing. And so now we, we begin to see that the authority and confidence... And the power that he desires is he desires to give it to us. And what is it for? It's not necessarily to change the weather, although that would be wonderful, right? You go to the beach and you say, God, can you just clear the skies for me today? Can you put it at this perfect temperature for me? And so this power and authority is not necessarily you controlling the weather, all right? That's not what this is for. It'd be wonderful, but that's not necessarily what it's for. But what he wants us to understand is that we are more than a conqueror, and if God be for us, who can be against us? He wants us to walk in confidence, not in ourselves, but to walk in confidence for what he has done and who he has called us to be. He wants us to walk in that confidence. Now you may be thinking, well, Pastor Bobby, how do I how do I do that? How do I continue to walk in that confidence? Well, I'm glad you asked, because this is why I believe these two passages of Scripture are connected to each other, that we're walking through two separate stories. But I believe they're fully connected to each other so that you and I can understand how we can actually walk in this confidence that Jesus desires to give us. And so the second thing is this, is that Jesus is going to display his power over spiritual forces. Watch this. It says this in verse 28. When he arrived at the other side in the region of Gadarenes, I said it, this, this, that word right. First service, I got tongue-tied, unbelievably. Have you, ever, have you ever come to a passage of Scripture you can't say the word right? You know, do this. Have some fun with it. Just go blah, blah, blah. Like that, you just, I mean, there's a lot of words and phrases in the Bible, right? That are just like, I don't even know how to say that, right? Or just use the version Bible app. The guy who says it in there, he says it perfectly every time. He's a perfect human being, apparently. He says every word correctly. It's amazing. I love that guy. I don't know his name. But anyways, um, where am I? Oh, yes, Bible. Okay, when he arrived at the other side of the region of Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Therefore, bacon was invented. Just seeing you all follow me. I couldn't help myself. All right. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. So Jesus is displaying his power over spiritual forces. What is Jesus, what is Matthew trying to get across here? Okay, so what we begin to understand is that, uh, again, there are other gospels here that will talk about the same story And they're giving their observations, much like this. If I uh, gave you a situation in here, you'd all come up with different observations and such. I'm trying to refrain from going into the other Gospels because I think we're going to take away from the message Matthew is trying to give us. Does everybody follow that? I want to make sure we understand what Matthew is trying to show us about Jesus here, which I think is absolutely powerful, is that this darkness has become normal in their community. In fact, No one is willing to go that direction. It has been labeled as unsafe, which means it has become normal to live with this darkness in their community. But who goes near? Jesus does. And this is what we're beginning to see with the demonic activity is they know when Jesus steps foot in the community. Now, I've said this often because a lot of times people think, that, oh, do you really believe that demons are real? Listen, you look up the most famous, popular movies in the world and they're all about supernatural stuff. People are more open to this idea of darkness than we realize. They're the most popular movies in the box office. Supernatural things happening. People are not, they are not necessarily uh, not believing that there is this possibility of demonic beings being involved in our world. Supernatural beings. Because they're showing up in the box office that people are very open to this idea of the supernatural. And demonic beings have not disappeared. They just get better at hiding. That is what they do. 
They get, a, they get a better way of deceiving people, which you're going to see them try deception even with Jesus. They're going to try deception. But we know this, that God is going to turn everything for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We're going to see that the enemy thinks he can deceive even Jesus. And Jesus is saying, listen, this message is going to get preached. And it's going to be written in my word. And the future generations are going to be able to look at this and learn a valuable spiritual lesson about who they are and who they've been called to be. Jesus is going to flip the script on the enemy like this. It's absolutely amazing. But we see that two demon-possessed men come to Jesus and watch. Remember, it says they were violent. They were violent if you approach. But what are they when they approach Jesus? They're not violent. What are they doing? They're actually submitting to Jesus. And they say, what do you want with us? Which means they have to follow anything Jesus says. They answer to him, which tells you something about God's sovereignty, how he is in control over good and the evil. And what did they say next? They say, Jesus, have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Which is telling us something that evil will eventually have fully run its course before Jesus 100% completely wipes out evil forever. Now, obviously there's no sin, no evil in heaven, but yes, there is darkness on this earth. Jesus is saying there's coming a day where that darkness will be removed forever. And the evil, and evil darkness even knows it. They know, and they even say it. Have you come? Has, have we run our full course? And has it been ended because you are in complete control? It's absolutely interesting what they are declaring about Jesus. They're saying to Jesus, Jesus, whenever you say it's time's up, we have to follow it. And they're coming and submitting to him. Absolutely amazing. They're not coming in violence. They're coming in submission to him. And they know whatever Jesus says, I must do. There's nothing they can do about it. It's absolutely interesting as we walk through what is taking place. And then it says there's some pigs feeding, feeding nearby. And Jesus will teach this in some of the gospel about what happens when he drives out demons. It says that demons must go and find somebody else. They must go and find somebody else. That is their job. That is what they do. So when Jesus removes them, they go and search for another vessel to enter. Jesus knows that. And so it almost not sounds like they're trying to make a deal with Jesus. Say, Jesus, we know if we get driven out by you, we're supposed to go find another vessel. However, will you drive us out into the pigs? Sounds like a good deal, right? You're not going to go into another vessel. You're going to go into the, to the pigs. Sounds like a good deal. And darkness thinks it's going to deceive Jesus. Watch this. Because what happens when the demons go into the pigs? Now, now for the sake of understanding this uh, and what Jesus is up against, there is in other Gospels that tells us this is several thousands of pigs. A lot of pigs. Which tells you how many demons Jesus is dealing with here. There's a lot of them. And they go in. And what happens? They run down the, the hillside and they enter the water and they drown themselves. The enemy thinks they have deceived Jesus because now they know that this uh, economy, a lot of it was involved with these pigs. A lot of it. Now, if you're a Jewish person in Jewish culture, they don't care about pigs, okay, in this time. They didn't care. They actually made a distinct, they actually believed there were similarities between pigs and demons. Like they just said it was the same, right? That was what they believed. So if you're a Jewish person reading that, you're just like, well, okay, then uh, that's okay. They took them out. We need those things gone anyway, right? This is a very, uh, this is like a more of a Gentile region, which kind of gives you an understanding of why there are pigs here. And so what happens is this, is that now the demons have drowned the pigs, and now those who have watched Jesus do this, they go to the town, tell them, hey, these guys have been delivered from all these demons. Remember the place we were not able to go? We can now go there. Oh, by the way, they just wiped out, he just wiped out all these pigs. We, he knocked out a big portion of our economy, is what they're saying. And what did they come to Jesus? They don't come and celebrate Jesus. What do they do? They're afraid of him. In fact, they're so afraid of him, they tell him to go, get out. They reject Jesus. And you're thinking, what? He just delivered them. 
He just, he just created an area of their part of their town where it was unsafe. Now it's safe. And they want him gone? This is what my point is, and this is what Matthew is trying to show us. Darkness is deceptive, and it's convincing. It's very deceptive, and darkness is actually very convincing. And we actually can be more like this group of people than we think, because darkness can be very, very convincing. And here's how I'm going to show you this. Because Jesus could have just said, no, you're not going, you're not telling me what you're going to do. I'm going to send you here or do this. Jesus lets them do it. And the enemy thinks it has deceived Jesus and gotten Jesus kicked out. But Jesus is going to use this story, this lesson in his gospels, and he's going to use it for future generations for people to understand the kind of authority they have in him. So the enemy thinks it's fooled Jesus when it has not fooled Jesus at all. But we're a lot like this crowd because these men, you would think you would be excited, but they're not. They beg Jesus to leave because they're afraid. In fact, they're more comfortable living in darkness because living in his light, walking in his freedom is too foreign and it feels like it's out of reach. There's no way. Have you ever thought that before? Living in his light, living for Jesus, following Jesus, feels so uncomfortable, so foreign. Feels like it's not attainable. This is what so many people believe, which is why I'm telling you, darkness is very, very convincing about what it's trying to do. And the second part of this is we need to understand this, is that... They actually blame who for the drowning? They blame Jesus. Don't we blame God for a lot of things that go wrong when it's the enemy doing it? Don't we do that all the time? God, why would you do that? How dare you? Or why don't you care? And we start blaming God for the things he never did. What did he do? He just sent them to the pigs. Who drowned the pigs? The demons did. And we blame God as if it was his fault when it was not him who did it. And so what we're seeing here is a lot of what darkness will do and how convincing it can really be. In fact, Jesus has come to give us his authority, but we're blinded by the darkness. Jesus has come to show us how good God is, but darkness will convince people that God is actually your enemy. You see how good he is? You see how convincing darkness can be? Jesus has come to do all of this for us. It's absolutely interesting. The the darkness will convince you of so many things. Jesus has come to die on the cross for the sins of the world so you and I could be forgiven and resurrect three days later to give us new life in his name. But it convinces people to reject Jesus because living in darkness is more comfortable. It's just easier this way. You see how convincing darkness can be. And when you reject light, which is Jesus Christ, what are you bringing in? Darkness. And I'm not saying that you're full of demons if you reject Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying Jesus is showing us the impact evil has on our world. Rejection is powerful. And we don't know the spiritual consequences of rejection. It blinds us from the realities of the spiritual world. Which is why, again, Matthew is showing us, Jesus must die on the cross. Why? To remove spiritual blindness. He must remove it. And he must die. And how do you get the spiritual blindness removed? By faith. Believe, then see. A lot of people want to see And then they want to believe. That is not how that works. Jesus says, believe in me, then you will receive. He has called people and tells them, I am willing to remove all the blindness. The spiritual blindness, the things that you say, this can't be possible, all this stuff. Believe in me that I can and watch what I'll do with your life. Jesus has to remove the blindness for people to receive him. This is absolutely interesting what Matthew 
is telling us because darkness can be very, very convincing. And so if you're here today, let me ask you this question. What has darkness convinced you of? What has that convinced you of? Today, you can have some blindness removed from your life. And this is what I'm telling you is number one, for those who are not a follower of Jesus, today you can receive it and he will remove it from you. It is so fascinating when a new believer comes to know Christ, immediately they start becoming aware of certain things. It is absolutely amazing to see how the flip of the switch happens. And it's not because they knew this before. It was because Jesus has begun his work. And salvation is wonderful. It starts in the moment, but it begins to transform you for the rest of your life. That is what salvation is. It's not just an event. It's a, yes, it's an event, but it's more than that. It's absolutely wonderful. Jesus is literally going to transform you for the rest of your life. He's removing blindness from your eyes over and over and over again. That is what he's come to do. But people will say, get away. I'm afraid of you. I don't believe you can. I don't believe I can follow you, Jesus. I'm too far gone, or God, I'm too much of a mess. God, let me fix myself first, and then I'll come to you. Jesus is saying, that is not how that works. Believe, and then you will receive. It's truly interesting. Now, you may be a follower of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you that there could be things that darkness has convinced you of that is not true? He's trying to convince you that he has a final authority over you or over that situation. And he does not. There is only one who says it is finished. And when he ever says it's finished, it's done, and it's Jesus. So what has darkness convinced you of? Has he convinced you that your son or daughter is too far gone? Has he convinced you that the diagnosis you have received is final? Has he convinced you that the best days are behind you? Has he convinced you that your mind will never recover? Has he convinced you that you'll never be enough? Has he convinced you of condemnation? Has he convinced you that God could never use you? What has he convinced you of? And there may be some of this stuff that no one else knows, but God knows. Darkness has convinced you of something, and it's very, very convincing because you see the reality. And Jesus needs to remove that blindness from you to open up your eyes to see what he sees. Jesus needs to get the authority in you. And if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm telling you, it is in you. So, Pastor Bobby, how do I walk in this confidence? Well, you begin to speak back the word of God into that dark place and to begin to declare who he is, what he has done, and who he's called you to be. Jesus says you are more than a conqueror, so therefore I will walk in victory, not defeat. You begin to quote it back to the darkness. When the darkness tries to convince you of something, you don't buy it. In fact, you tell him some things. You tell him you've messed with the wrong grandparent. You've messed with the wrong mama. I like to call him mama bear. Mess with the wrong mama bear. You've messed with the wrong family. You've messed with the wrong son or daughter. You've messed with the wrong school. You've messed with the wrong community. You've messed with the wrong neighborhood. You've messed with the wrong business. And you call on the name that is above all names. Because when you call on the name of Jesus, when you walk in that power and authority, the demons must answer to him. And whatever he says, they must do. So whatever darkness has convinced you of, declare today that that is not final. Jesus has the final word. So you call on the name of Jesus and you declare with power and authority that is in you that no weapon formed against you will prosper that there's no mountain in front of you that cannot be moved. I don't care what you have been convinced of. You declare back to that darkness, no, you don't have the authority here. You don't have the authority over my health. Jesus does. You don't have the authority over my family. Jesus does. You don't have the authority over my friendships or my, my home or, or my kids. Jesus does. Don't let the darkness convince you of something that is contrary to the Word of God. So you declare 
that you belong to Jesus and remind yourself today that he paid the price so that this authority could be in you. So now you can walk, not in defeat, you can walk in simply victory every day, all the time. Because again, today, tomorrow, the next day, the enemy will try to convince you of something else. But don't you fall into the trap of that. Remind yourself of what God's word says, that greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. Therefore, I will not be afraid and intimidated to walk in the calling that he has placed on my life. I will not walk in intimidation. I will not walk in fear. I will move forward. And there's nothing the enemy can do about it when a believer begins to do that. And trust me, there is going to be a a combat between light and darkness when you start to operate that way. Because you know why? The enemy is absolutely 100% afraid of you. He is absolutely 100% afraid of you when you begin to discover the authority that is within you. And he will throw everything in your path physically, mentally, emotionally, because he doesn't want you to operate in it. Because if you do, things move forward and the church of Jesus Christ gets built, which is the thing he's trying to prevent. This is wonderful news, isn't it? This is why I tell people all the time, the good news is it's good, but it's the best. There's nothing like it. There's no word of God that's like it. There's nothing like the presence of God. There's nothing like him at all. The Bible is very clear. Nothing compares to him which is why his word is so powerful. So today you may need to have some blindness removed from your life. Today I want to give two opportunities. Number one, I want to give opportunity for those who want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to call you out. We're not going to mention you by name. We're not going to tell people where you're sitting, anything like that. I just want to know as a church, we'd like to pray a prayer of salvation together as a church. And we want to be able to do that if there are those in the room who would like to receive that today. Jesus just simply says, call in the name of the Lord and you will be saved. I can't call for you. I would in a heartbeat if I could. But Jesus says you must call. And we've been having people call on Jesus and we're beginning to see amazing transformation take place in their life. Because why? They called. They knew they needed Jesus. It's simply saying, Jesus, I can't live this life without you. Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a Savior and a Lord. He, you are simply just declaring who he is and who he has invited you. He's invited you into his kingdom and he wants you to come. But there's a way you must do it. And it's simply submitting to him, saying, Jesus, I'm a mess. I'm broken. I'm messed up. I don't think you, I don't know if I can even do this, but Jesus, I'm willing to call on you because you told me with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And I'm going to take you up on that today. Or maybe today, the other call would simply be this, is that there's something the enemy has convinced you of. And you don't need to be embarrassed or ashamed of this because it's all happened to us. It's happened to me. And I've been convinced that it's final and this is just the way it is. And Jesus is telling you today, no, 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 no. It is not final. I just need to remove the blindness that is preventing you from believing. So would you bow your heads with me this morning? You heard the call. First, for those who would like to receive Jesus Christ, we're not going to call you out by name, like I said, or embarrass you. I just want you to know this is the best place you could have been today. But you must call on Jesus. If you've not received his free gift of salvation or if you've been away from God, but today you want to come back to God. He welcomes you with open arms. As you have clearly seen in this chapter, he has welcomed the outsider. He's welcomed those who felt condemned. He's welcomed those who felt unworthy. He's welcomed those who feel like they were living in 100% complete darkness. He had welcomed all of them. That covers about everybody, I believe. So certainly he will welcome you. And if you want to receive Jesus, would you just lift your hand today? No embarrassment, no shame. I just want to know if there's somebody here today who would like to receive. I'll give you just a moment. Just lift your hand. Just up in the air and just say, Pastor Bobby, that's me today. I'm just going to give you just a moment. Thank you so much. If you're here this morning and today there is an area of your life that you've been convinced of, And you just need to lay it at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, remove the blindness of the thing I have been convinced of. That I thought it was just the way it is. It's just final. And Jesus will remove that spiritual blindness from you. And if that 
if you want that today, you know the situation, you know the circumstance that you're walking through. Would you just slip your hand up along with mine and say, Pastor Bob, I just, I need to release this to Jesus. There's hands going up everywhere. Would you lift your hand to the Lord today and say, Lord, I'm giving it to you. I, I've been convinced of it, but Lord, I, I'm wanting to believe and trust you. So God, I'm giving it to you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who lifted their hands, those maybe who wanted to. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your authority, something we do not deserve, but you offer it to us. And Lord, I pray for those today who have been convinced of something that you never said was final. Lord, I know that we all have fallen into that category at one point or another, including myself. And Lord, I pray today that you would remove the blindness that is preventing us to believe that you have come and that all authority belongs to you and that you have the final say. Only you, when you say it is finished, is it truly finished. And Lord, today we thank you for the victory that is in Jesus Christ. We look forward to seeing how you help us and develop us into being more and more like a conqueror that you have called us to be. And so, Father, today I pray that those who lifted their hands, they would walk in victory today. They would not walk with their heads down, but they would look up and realize, Lord, how incredible you are and how great the power of Jesus Christ that is within them. So, Father, we thank you today. We worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Would you stand today and would you give a round of applause today for those who are responding today? I want to invite our prayer teams forward this morning. I want to invite them forward and uh, we'll do a, just a quick prayer of dismissal today. If you need prayer today as you leave, uh, just know that these folks would love to come and pray with you this morning. So feel free to approach them with whatever you need prayer for. They'll pray with you today. But I want to pray a specific blessing over each person. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the privilege it is to know you. God, we thank you that you have called us to operate and to walk in this power that Jesus Christ has. Lord, we thank you for his death and resurrection on the cross that gives us the ability to have this power operate within us. So, Father, I pray that we would walk out of here in the power of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, that you would continue to help us walk in victory. Lord, let us be a living representation of you everywhere we go. And, Lord, bringing this good news, the best news, to all the world. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Praise the Lord. <laughs>